Okay. Uh, welcome to the um, 1848's latest uh, uh, webinar. Uh, uh, this one being on kitchen operations. Uh, the um, I see uh, I this is Pete Welsh with the 1848 properties, one of the directors. I see a fellow director here, John Zizza, who yesterday led a very informative uh, uh, webinar on cleaning operation with CSL management, uh, who uh, gave us some great tips on um, cleaning um, uh, ideas and solutions, no pun intended. The, um, every one of these uh, presentations is recorded and would be accessible on our uh, 1848 properties website. And uh, the, uh, for, uh, actually it's the FIGAM, well, FIGAM.org website with, uh, uh, you go to graduates, you go to housing, and you'll see all sorts of uh, great resources and uh, things that 1848 is uh, pulling together and it's, uh, it's an ongoing updated process. So uh, our goal is to try to provide the latest uh, uh, resources and tips and assistance for all areas of uh, BG housing. And uh, today we're gonna be focusing on kitchen operations. Um, there are questions that uh, uh, I'm sure are burning in anybody's mind right now that has a uh, kitchen operation and has the responsibility for one in a fraternity house and uh, um, safety naturally being right at the top of that list and uh, how do you get uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, adv health advisory posters and um, should brothers be assisting in uh, food preparation these days, how do I know my cook is uh, healthy and safe, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, to answer these questions uh, and a whole lot more, um, we have the great pleasure of having uh, Shanna Smith, Director of uh, Strategic Partnerships at, at Upper Crust Food Service. Uh, Upper Crust is a preferred provider uh, for Phi Gamma Delta and has worked very closely with 1848 uh, for years now as we've developed our resources and has uh, uh, has uh, basically is the industry leader for Greek food service uh, preparation, service administration, et cetera, has uh, hundreds of locations or clients throughout the country. And uh, at least five of them are Phi Gamma Delta and at least another five are uh, chapters are discussing right now um, uh, employing upper crust. So uh, there's a lot of, um, knowledge of who we are, what we do, and uh, a lot that Shauna can uh, share with us. Um, and uh, that's, our, um, that's our introduction. Shauna has, uh, I'm about to turn the uh, presentation over to you. You have a, um, uh, a great PowerPoint to, that everybody could follow. As from a housekeeping standpoint, uh, I'd ask that everybody go mute right now. And if you have questions, uh, please use the chat function to, uh, to uh, type them in and we will do our best to address them. Um, you can open, you can unmute uh, during the uh, Q&A. So with that, Shauna, thank you for joining us. Welcome to uh, the webinar. Well, thank you everyone and I appreciate it. I'm going to um, share my screen and as Peter said, um, if we can use the chat button for questions, um, we can answer all those at the end and hopefully um, I have answers for you and we've done it in the presentation. So let me just share, share my screen and we can get started. Okay, come on. There it goes. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You're up and going. Great. So, um, First of all, once again, my name is Shanna Smith. I am an Alpha Phi, went to school at the University of Montana. Um, I too am a House Corporation Board um, volunteer. So I always say I feel I can share everybody's pain on this call um, from a housing standpoint and working with 18 to 22 year olds. So uh, they keep us on our toes. 
So we're going to start off. Uh, basically, you know, this is going to be our agenda. It's welcome to the new normal. Um, we're going to talk about COVID-19 impact on food um, practices, possible food service changes, um, some frequently asked questions, uh, things that have come up to us throughout this COVID-19, and then answer your questions. Uh, I will say that you know, it is changing on a daily basis. So what is our new normal today? If your school is on a quarter system and you're starting the end of September, this could look very different and also depending on your state. So to start off with, um, the impact on food is COVID-19 a food safety. At this time, um, both the CDC and the US are not any reports um, at the time of human illness that suggests COVID-19 transmitted by food or food packaging. Um, this, they are, you know, updating on a pretty regular basis. Uh, I would say too, as Peter talked about the um, sites that are there, you know, the USDA, CDC, the CDC is basically the issue for all of us. I know it was in the cleaning seminar um, and pretty much everybody goes there first um, and then there's other sources out there. Um, is food imported from other countries or states affected by the COVID-19 um, risk? And once again, there's no evidence to support the claims of COVID-19 associated with imported food and no reported cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. associated with these goods. Um, some people have said, you know, do we need to take our food out of, if it comes in a case, you know, a, a box and it's, you know, number 10 cans of tomatoes, do we need to take them out of the box? Um, you do not. It is not um, being transmitted that way. You would want to just way of keeping your pantry, but it has nothing to do with COVID-19. Um, you get infected with COVID-19 by touching food, food packaging, or food storage. Once again, um, EDC, USDA, there's no evidence of food um, or food packaging being associated with transmission of COVID-19. The coronavirus needs a living host to grow. So that means an animal or a human, it cannot grow in food. Um, and like other viruses, it's possible, you know, that the virus that caused this COVID-19 can survive on a surface or objects. Um, that is one of the reasons um, from a cleaning standpoint, there's been a lot of folk on that for cleaning, disinfecting and sanitizing surfaces. Um, is, if a kitchen employee is infected with COVID-19, would my food, the food be produced, be safe to eat? Um, food personnel who are ill with COVID-19 or any other illness should be excluded from your work activity because they create unsanitary conditions. And this would be, you know, if they had the flu, the chicken pox, whatever it is, they should just not be in your kitchen. Um, once again, Currently, no evidence to support the transmission of the virus uh, directly by eating food that might inadvertently mean the virus. The other big piece of this is if I was prepping food in your kitchen and, and it is being cooked at 350 degrees and being held to all of the proper um, surf safe um, guidelines, you know, it's being killed. First of all, I shouldn't have been at work if I was sick, but um, it's not being transmitted through the food. Um, best practices for food handling. And as I go through all of this, if you use a food service company, um, you know, they should be doing all of this. If you have your own chef or you're independent, you just need to be making sure they're doing this too. So everything that I'm giving you tonight can work for your own staff um, if you're um, employing them directly. So as always, follow good hygiene and food safety practices. Purchasing your food from reputable sources, um, cooking thoroughly and maintaining the safe holding temperatures, good personal hygiene, 
clean and sanitize surfaces and equipment, um, and then adding the added emphasis on surface certification. For most of our um, health departments, they require that somebody that is on staff at the time of service has a surf safe certification. So if you run a kitchen and you've got your breakfast cook in there, and the main chef doesn't come in till lunch, both of them will have to have surf safe certification. Whoever is the lead in your kitchen needs to have that certification. Um, you can get that through the National Restaurant Association um, through their Surf Safe link. And up until about a week ago, they were offering it for free. And it's normally about a hundred and hundred and fifteen dollar class. Um, so you might just want to have, even if it somebody's um, certification expires this year, and if the class is free, now's a great time to do it and encourage other people in your kitchen to do it. Um, it is a three-year um, certification. Uh, when it came out, you know, I sometimes help out in the kitchen when needed as I travel and I thought, well, I probably, you know, I had my old food handler's permit years ago. So I went in, took it for free. Um, it takes about two hours online to do it. So, um, and if any of you as House Corporation Board or other uh, roles on a house corporation board kind of said you want to take it, hey, feel free. Um, you can print off your certification and go in the kitchen. Um, potential food service changes that are going to happen, and this is all coming from the top down. So it's starting with the government organizations, the CDC, the FDA, USDA, and then that's moving down to your state and local health departments, which then is being filtered down to any university regulations. Plus, you're getting input, um, some groups are from their national international organizations. So like at 1848 Properties or Fiji on the fraternity, fraternity side said, here's some things we want to see happen. And then it comes down to the local board. Um, so all of these layers are playing into account what we have to do in the kitchen, just, you know, as what you have to do to your house. But what we've always, we're saying to everybody is we're going to take our lead from the customer. So if you as the local house corporation board said, um, say the local health department says you don't need to wear masks, but you as a local house corporation board said, we would like everybody in the kitchen to wear a mask we are going to do what you would like. The flip side is, if the health department and CDC require a mask and you say, ah, you don't need to, we are still going to follow uh, the local health department because that is who's inspecting your kitchen or your university's inspecting it. Um, I do know of a couple places that have said nobody has inspected our kitchen since um, we got our occupancy. And I have said to all of them, I think they'll be back. I think if you had nobody inspecting for the last couple of years, I do think at some point they will return um, with this. Another great um, organization is the National Restaurant Association because they've got some great guidelines out there of how they've been opening restaurants. What's driving the changes? Of course, social distancing the extensive cleaning and sanitizing and the biggest is the concern with the multiple contact platforms this is the self-service buffets and salad bars um, there's going to be this we can all control and some we will put our best foot forward do our best i think of especially the social distancing um, but none of us are going to be the social distancing police or monitors but we kind of rules um, and hope, you know, as 18 to 22 year olds, they make some great decisions. So getting into on um, the food service changes, you know, buffet service being eliminated. Um, Self-service buffets and salad bars might no longer be approved or allowed. Um, this is a true potential um, and it's probably the biggest thing that we're seeing if you've got any 
your state has opened up restaurants and you had um, a Ruby Tuesdays or what is it, an OK Corrals that were strictly buffet type restaurants, you'll probably notice most of them have not reopened. Um, they have stayed closed. But what we're going to see as an alternate is a staffing buffet service. So um, for those of us that I can see pictures um, with Peter and John, we're kind of all about that same age group. Um, this would be the old lunch lady mentality, whereas if you remember from school, you went on the lunch line on one side and the staff was on the other and was putting whatever you asked on the plate. Um, this one, we are seeing um, quite a few universities moving to this right now. Um, it's going to eliminate the contamination of the utensils. Um, it does help that your kitchen staff can help monitor the social distancing in the buffet lines. From our standpoint, um, we like it because it's putting our staff out there. So there is this customer service piece um, that benefits. And like I said, being able to kind of help them stay six feet apart um, on there. So this is kind of the predominant one we're seeing right now. Um, the other alternate is they've said no to the buffet, no to the um, staff buffet, and it is all being packaged in individual containers. Um, what you're seeing here is um, some stuff that we did at the University of Oklahoma because we continued to serve even after they went um, online. And we did all of our, you know, all of the meals were in to-go boxes for them to take. Up and take. Um, this does give the possibility for members to pre-order. So speaking from our standpoint, we have an app that they use for late plates. The app will just be used for pre-ordering. So, and it allows them to customize. So if they don't want, you know, if they didn't want carrots, um, they could have just said no carrots and carrots wouldn't have been in their to-go um, box. Also, we'll see, probably, we'll see more composed salads since the salad bar would not be there. You know, there may be some choices um, of a couple different salads that we can grab on the side up um, in there that we'll see. The um, biggest piece of this is um, if you are a chapter that was really into being eco friendly and using combustible you know, compostable products, this is not going to be your friend because the cost of those um, compared to foam is usually about two to three times more. So this may be a time where you have to kind of think, am I going to save on my costs at least for this time and then go back? Um, also, we'll probably see some larger um, garbage, you know, from a budgetary standpoint, having to look at the increase in garbage on there. Another alternate, and we do this um, for houses of about 60 people and less, is a make order. So they are, it's a predetermined menu. They're coming in or doing it off the app and placing their order, and it's being made um, when they get there. Um, part of this is, you know, it may increase the wait time for meals um, with everybody going to that. Uh, but it still gives them that ability to have some customization. And I think everything I have seen, that is kind of some of the biggest fear that, you know, I'm going to be stuck what everybody else is eating versus able to pick and choose like they can now. Um, be a little bit more like a restaurant ordering off the menu. Here's what you get. So, but you know, the made to order menu we currently do um, on a lot of our campuses. Uh, right. Kitchen access. So if you have a kitchen that you allow the members access, this is your time to shut it down. Um, we are going to see the kitchen is going to be limited really to food service professionals. The health department is not everybody coming in and out of there. Um, so that part of it, um, I think if you want to do kind of 
Oh, Excuse me, Sean. Okay. This is the uh, you had a day. brothers. If you haven't muted your uh, your uh, connection, please mute this now. There's some background noise. To do that, go to your uh, picture. There's a little blue mute button, and just click it, and then all excess sound will disappear. Thank you so much. Back to you, Sean. Thank you. Um, I have a you know friend that has said, this is your time to use the COVID cover. So if you have been trying to implement anything, um, open access is one of them. Um, this is a great time to be able to say, I'm just sorry, you know, due to COVID, you will not have access into the kitchen. We have to leave it for the, the cook or the chef only. Um, and so I think we will, you know, see a lot of this happen right now. Beverage changes. So if you have the milk machine or you're doing gallons of milk or other types of beverages, you're really going to see these probably going to the half pints or pints um, because the machine and the gallon jugs just means people are touching them, the multiple exposure on it versus they're going to take that carton of milk and it's theirs and away they go. Um, I think for um, everyone going to individual milk or individual juices, uh, you stand a greater chance of those items going back to off-campus housing or to bedrooms because you don't see anybody grabbing the milk machine and walking down the street. But those half pints are a little easier to get thrown in a backpack and away they go. So. You know, we have said to our clients, we will just work with you and kind of have an idea of how many should be out. And if we start to really see the amount increase, then we're just going to have those discussions individually with the chapter. Because um, they're pretty good about knowing who is doing that. Um, another one is quite a few groups have a snack program. So they have had individual snacks, but they've also had bulk snacks and the bulk snack containers are going to go away. Um, once again, whether it's tongs or a scoop or whatever, they do not want multiple contacts. So if you do provide any snacks um, for your chapter house, it's really going to you know, be it's the individual bags of goldfish versus the big uh, container of goldfish to grab into. And then your 24-7, your some people call them a weekend kitchen, a servery access. Those kitchens and the refrigerator in there are really need to only consist of individually packaged foods and no longer member individual member storage. Um, late plates can still be stored in that because they're in their own container with a name. But you know, if Peter went to the subway, bought a sub, ate half of it, and put the other half back in, that can't happen anymore. Um, so just need to, that will be a change. I've heard some campuses saying that if they have an individual, you know, there is a refrigerator, say, on the second or third floor in a study room, they're saying they don't want those operating at all. Um, it'll be kind of interesting to see how this plays out. Um, Bulk leftover containers would be eliminated. A lot of time, your chef um, puts, you know, if there was a half a pan of lasagna, they're putting it into the refrigerator for the guys to be able to eat at 11 o'clock at night. That can't happen anymore. Um, the way to really do that is you leftovers in, um, you know, containers like to-go boxes and put them in the refrigerator. Um, if you supply any plates or utensils in that area, they need to be disposable so that they can use them and throw them away. Um, we don't want them to be in charge of washing their own plates right there. Um, late plates will continue um, because those are being um, created individually for that member. And so that will um, continue um, as it so disposable versus dishware. So this is where some costs, there'll be some cost increases. Um, 
It's uh, being suggested by the CDC that all meals be served on single use plates and utensils. Um, if real items are used, you need to ensure your dishwasher is properly stocked with chemicals and the sanitizing system is working properly. So you will not, you will need to make sure your dishwasher is being serviced prior to school starting. Um, and then we're also using a three compartment sink you know, for staff that's um, washing, usually a lot of times it's the big pots and pans, is also to make sure they're um, utilizing a proper sanitizing rinse and that it's being um, created at the right um, percentage. Um, if you have to go to all disposable, um, based on everything our procurement manager has found and depending on where you're located, um, so, Really, West Coast and East Coast, we're seeing almost $100 per person per semester. Um, that 25 is really kind of more central Midwest, you know, Nebraska, South Dakota. But that's the range that we are seeing. So if you're charging your members $1,000 a semester on a meal plan and you want to, you're going to disposables, you will want to increase your uh, meal plan to about 1100 unless you just have a budget and you're just going to absorb that but this should help you from a budgetary standpoint of knowing um, kind of what's going to come down the pipe on that um, some frequently asked questions that we've gotten is um, in this a lot of these questions um, if you have your own staff you just need to come up with your own plan because if you haven't gotten a call from a parent, and I got three today, all wanting to know what I was doing to safeguard their daughter as she came back to school. And I first said, I can't guarantee your safety. Because any of us have been on any webinars, especially with our insurance companies, that's the one thing, you can't guarantee safety. So I said, based on that, but here's what we're doing. Um, so will UCFS employees be screened for COVID-19? We have a procedure in place um, to screen for the common symptoms. Um, we are not doing at this point unless it's requested by the House Corporation Board or it's a requirement by the Health Department. We are not doing the temporal thermometer checks uh, because some of that gets into some weird HIPAA stuff and then making sure you've got some things in place. Um, but any employee showing symptoms will not be allowed um, to work in our facility until they have subsided over the 14 days. And I think it's two negative tests. Um, so we are taking care of that on our employee side. Um, do we have a plan in place? Yes, we do. Um, we have a COVID employee plan that we have developed. Um, and so, you know, it talks about for us of how we're going to handle an employee if they test positive, how we're going to handle if they are in close contact. Um, and I always stress that close contact doesn't mean you just walk past them in the servery. You know, that's not the definition of it. You need to have been around them. Um, but we do have a plan in place. And I know that that has been given, given to um, 18 um, You know, I think if you have your own chef, you need to kind of figure out, especially if you are a house that has one chef, what are you going to do if the chef tests positive and is out for 14 days? How, how are you going to get food and deal with meal service? Um, it's a lot easier to have these plans in place than to try to deal with <laughs> happen because you're dealing with it and their parents are calling you. <laughs> so much easier to plan ahead on this. Um, do we have access to CDC EPA approved cleaning products? Yes, we do. Um, our suppliers have stocked the approved products um, for our staff to use to sanitize the kitchen. Um, Customers request additional products to be purchased for sanitation for the rest of the house through our PO system. Um, and we're providing a price list of available um, products to our customers. So I can tell you that I believe it is on 
um, our resource um, or our website link is on um, the COVID resource for Phi Gamma Delta. And if you click on that, there is an essential order guide, and that is open to all PG chapters. You do not have to be an Upper Crust Food Service uh, client. We are making that available. And so um, the contact um, for Mason is on that. I, we just tell everybody, we put the list together, and he updates it as products are coming in and out. So right now, I will tell everybody, he has a great lead on Clorox sanitizing wipes, and he's been able to get those. But, um, you know, he couldn't get them two weeks ago. So he's updating that, and then I just say, you know, the pricing kind of, he has a price now and he has found when he goes to place those orders for people, you know, when they've waited about a week or so, there's been some price changes, but he will get all that information. Um, there's also some stuff like a um, reusable permanent to-go box. A lot of houses moving to, we're just going to buy a to-go box and up to the chapter to bring them back to be cleaned and sanitized in the kitchen because we don't want to pay um, the cost on um, disposables. Because basically after a month, you have paid for a permanent um, to-go box cost-wise. Um, what's happening on the food supply chain? As we know, um, anybody was at the grocery store at the very beginning, beef disappeared, chicken, besides toilet paper and all the cleaning supplies. So we have seen some production plants shut down due to the outbreak, um, but you know what we've heard from Tyson and quite a few of the meat facilities is everything is going to be back to normal levels by mid-July. So really, by the time everybody comes back to school, we should see um, a normal production. Um, however, we are letting people know you just need to be flexible. Um, because it could be that there ends up this big run on poultry and your menu might have to change. So I think some of this is also setting the expectations for chapter members on, it may say, you know, fettuccine alfredo with grilled chicken, but we may not have gotten grilled chicken in and it's another protein has been substituted or we have gone to spaghetti and meatballs or whatever it is. Um, so just getting everybody used to some flexibility. Um, will staff be wearing masks? Yes, we believe masks are the new gloves um, and our um, employees will be equipped with masks. And if you, I would just recommend it. Um, I'm seeing a lot of house corporation boards require their members to wear masks coming into the serving, into the servery or the buffet lines, or how when they come to pick up their food, they're going to require that they have a mask on. Um, so I think that's that's a good one. Um, is price price going to increase due to COVID? Um, we are not expecting any price increases on our side due to the pandemic. Um, we're dedicated to providing high level of quality and service at the best price. And unless our environment changes dramatically, we don't anticipate a price increase. Um, even if it is the staff serving, we are not seeing a price increase um, for our clients. Um, two things though that can overall impact your food budget are gonna be your increased cost in disposables and chemical, cleaning chemicals. Um, that the, that's one of them and then the other is going to be if you have a decrease in your meal plan participation so that could result in a higher cost per person to cover the cost of your chef um, i can use for example a sorority at nebraska who last year had 35 people living in and plus they had all these people on the live out plan um, and their meal plan was, I think, a little over $1,000, maybe $1,080 for a 14 meal plan. This year, they are not going to do any out-of-house meals. And they actually moved to a smaller facility. There's 14 of them. 
they wanted to know what their price would be for a chef or do they do it as a drop and i was able to give them both and i was like well if you want a chef in there for 14 people your new meal plan cost per semester is two thousand five hundred and eighty dollars a person because there's kind of a minimum on what you've got to pay for wages or we can drop food off and it was like a thousand bucks or 900 it was significantly less haven't heard from them but i'm guessing they're going they're going to go with a meal drop versus paying a chef to cook for 14 people um, they chose not to have any out of house participation because they didn't want additional members coming um, so that you know that is something to look at if you're looking at dropping um, your participation then you've you've got to figure out how you're going to um, cover that cost um, on that and then let's see um, can we add additional meals to the meal plan so um, Fiji House has asked me, it's one we're working with this fall, they normally do a 15 meal plan, which means they do breakfast, lunch, and dinner Monday through Thursday, breakfast and lunch on Friday, and a Sunday dinner. And because the concern was, you know, a fraternity house is a little safer place, you know, we're eating is our own group versus a dining hall with thousands. So they said, can we add a Saturday brunch? And can we also stock their 24-7 um, kitchen with single serve items? You know, burritos, stuff that they over the weekend can heat and eat. And so we have added that onto their meal plan. Um, you also may end up having some live out members that their parents may, you know, be more comfortable having them eat at the house or come get their meal at the house than to be in a large um, dining hall in a university. So it does give you that ability to add some um, people to your plan, make some stuff a little more affordable. Um, so we've just been working with everybody, you know, on a case by case basis on this. Um, so time to be able to answer any questions. Um, I've got, we have additional resources online and it's at www.uppercrustfoodservice.com slash COVID, C-O-V-I-D. You have to type in this URL to get to our COVID page. You cannot access it if you just went into uppercrustfoodservice.com, kind of put it behind a little barrier. Um, you can also email me directly, Shanna at uppercrustfoodservice.com. I'm more than happy to help, you know, answer any questions, um, give my two cents if you want it, um, listen, you know, share your pain, whatever it is. Um, and then we just want to thank 1848 Properties for our continued partnership. Um, we are a resilient group as Greeks. And we will make it through these tough times. Um, we really feel too that this is really going to impact us heavy in the fall. I think every campus is going to take spring differently um, based on what happens, you know, on their college campus. Um, you know, is there a spike, you know, whatever's happening. Um, but we really feel fall is going to be a much tighter rain uh, compared to spring. I will tell you, we will all do our best. Um, but as I had a mother tell me today, I know my daughter's going back to school. I can't control who she, what fraternity she goes to and what kind of party they have and who she ends up sharing a beer with or kissing throughout the night. And I went, well, that's true. That part of it, we have no control over. Um, we can just try to give them as many, you know, resources as possible um, to keep them you know as safe as we can um, and to keep our own staff um, safe too. Um, Peter are there any questions? Yeah uh, uh, if any questions uh, uh, I'm looking at the chat box right now and I don't see any I've got a couple myself but uh, okay. and uh, John might but um, brothers if you have any uh, questions feel free to type them in on the chat we'll do our best Shauna will do her, her best to answer or 
maybe collectively we could share experiences. Uh, uh, I do have a question um, on the uh, gets into kitchen set staffing, cook mm -hmm. or uh, assistance uh, that on the traditional model where the where the chapter is uh, employed, if they find that the uh, they've lost their cook for whatever reason, health or otherwise, um, or need to add additional staff, uh, does Upper Crust uh, pro, uh, could Upper Crust be a resource in helping the interviewing of um, potential candidates for that kitchen that they are in contract with? Yes, we can and we have done that um, for some house corporation boards, especially when they have been located like at, you know, the University of North Dakota or, you know, some places where it's a little harder to find, um, you know, find some applicants. So, you know, we are more than happy to do that can help with some ads. You know, we know kind of what's worked for us on putting ads out on Indeed, et cetera. I would say right now, if you have staff, if you're, if you're employing any as your, of your members as staff, like having, you know, a couple members that are doing the dishes and they're employed, you really kind of want to look at that and see if you are better off separating that out. And I just know that a lot of women's groups that have employed houseboys or hashers or busboys that go by different names, a lot of them are looking at this fall of not employing them because they don't know where they have been and so they are pushing it to the kitchen. Um, and I know with some of the groups we work with, they were like, hey, you know, we don't want a houseboy, just hire a, you know, a dishwasher or whatever. So you may have to kind of look at some of that. And if, you, if you're hiring your members to help out your chef in the kitchen, I would ask them too how comfortable they are with that. I mean, because they're in a much more close proximity um, with that. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> did I, uh, in your uh, uh, very generous offer to uh, share to, um, clients and other fraternity uh, ch chapters, the um, re uh, uh, resources, purchasing resources for uh, mm -hmm. supplies, et cetera. Would that also include posters or required uh, postings that um, are kind of universal and, and, uh, and helpful and common sense uh, reminders, uh, washing your hands, et cetera. Is that something that you would have available uh, for those? I think yeah, I think Peter, so on our site, you know, if you look at our um, post COVID operational plan, it's a, like a five page document. The last two are some posters that you can just print off. One of them is on hand washing and the other is on something else. Um, those are there. Um, as far as printing and sending, I think it's probably easier for people just to go online and print. Um, the CDC has amazing ones. I was telling Peter earlier today, Los Angeles County Health Department has some amazing posters and just resources um, out there. You know, it will say, some of them say CDC, some of them say Los Angeles Health Department, but they've got good graphics um, and that type of thing. The other piece, um, I was going to next week reach out to Dio and Peter, you and I talked about this, is possibly there's some basic posters that um, could be made available that 1848 Properties tags it with their logo, and then you're just printing them, um, people can print them off, you know, and it's, you know, putting them in the bathrooms, um, the bathroom doors, in the servery. Um, it's kind of all those places, you know, if you're buying hand sanitizer, or getting a hand sanitizer station, you really want those coming in and coming in your facility by your doors or going into your kitchen servery area where the people are going through the food line. Those are kind of what we're seeing are kind of the biggest places or a chapter room. Um, I had somebody ask if they should be in a bathroom and I said, after all of this, I really hope people are washing their hands when they leave the bathroom. Um, <laughs> but that could also be, or a study room um, on that type of thing. 
but I think posters, you know, I'll reach out to Dio and see if there's something that we can work on. Yeah, we'll talk with Dio as well, and that's an excellent uh, observation about LA County Health, and uh, I'm, I myself am going to do a little research on that and see what might be appropriate uh, for even beyond kitchen operations as to uh, anything, you know, bathrooms or anything else house related. Uh, that's great. Um, are there any other questions? Shannon, this is John. I have a question. Sure. Are, are you seeing any kind of impact with food service delivery to your kitchens as a result of the COVID-19? I mean, are, pe are people still showing up on their regular scheduled uh, time to, to deliver food or, or are they changing their schedules or are they more random? Can you speak to that? Well, since we haven't opened up a kitchen yet, it's going to be, it's a little hard to say. Um, I think they will be because, you know, I think what's happening right now is so many of them have furloughed people. So, you know, as we set up new, new client accounts, you know, U.S. Foods is our predominant supplier. You know, they, Cisco, Gordon's, um, all of them have laid off people. So getting some information into their systems a little slower, but they also all know things are gonna gear back up like they normally do. So we feel good about that. Um, I, think, I think it's really not gonna be there arriving in time. It could be some stuff's not available. Um, and usually you, you know, when you order that food, probably, I'm going to say 80% of the time you're going to find out when you're doing your online order that's not available. Sometimes it's going to, you're not going to know till it gets there. Um, I think, I think there's going to be things that are back ordered. Um, when this all happened, I put in an order. If anybody uses Ecolab, Ecolab's got some great posters. They can get a lot of things. And so I put in an order with my Ecolab for some of the touchless hand sanitizer stations. This was before Upper Crust was doing all this. Um, you know, my delivery for those eight stations isn't scheduled till mid-July. You know, I got all the product in this week and I had to go meet the truck and stuff's being delivered differently. So this stuff came in on an 18 wheeler that could not get behind the house because it's a bigger truck than what normally would come in. Um, so I told them, I said, you got to park in the center of the street and then pallet jack that thing around the house to get to the back of the kitchen, which he did. Um, so I noticed that was a little different. Um, but I think, I think some, especially the cleaning supply stuff, um, ordering it now, just to make sure you are getting it in July or August, you know, is probably a good thing because that's going to be the type of thing that's on back order. Um, and I personally would suggest you don't supply cleaning supplies for your students for their rooms. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, none of us did before. You know, we never cleaned their room. It was up to them to clean it. And uh, the biggest thing I've heard is if we as a house corporation board supply cleaning product, it will end up in somebody's room and never come out to be shared, or it will go to that Fiji house where five guys live off campus and it's going to be in their stock for cleaning and you won't see it um, you know, getting used how it should be. Um, but, you know, food-wise, John, it's just going to be, you know, until they start showing up um, when school deliveries start happening. So. I think we figured that out a uh, long time ago, at least at our location, with light bulbs and toilet paper. We yeah. <laughs> those have a tendency to grow legs and walk out the door. Yes, they do. Uh -huh. And I, I've heard a lot of talk of, you know, having about a month to six weeks supply you know, the toilet paper, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if people are doing that as much now because, you know, you can, you're seeing toilet paper and paper towels, you know, back in the grocery stores and that kind of stuff. Um, and I do know if you're looking for hand sanitizer wipes, we have an outlet, but they just came, um, Amazon just posted that they're available um, at Amazon. I should say as of yesterday, they were available. That could be 
could have changed by today. Yeah. Uh, so. That's encouraging. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> well, I think, I think you, uh, Shauna, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's awfully clear that uh, as a resource for anything kitchen related, um, and with getting the latest information as a source, Shauna and Upper Crust are the place to go. They've been a terrific partner of ours. Uh, they will can, they uh, are actively uh, operating Fiji kitchens uh, for, um, or food service actually, better said, uh, for chapters. And that's probably going to be a number that grows over the coming years. And uh, um, we'll be I'm sure uh, hearing more from Shauna in the future and uh, getting updates, which will be posted to 1848 um, uh, properties portion of the FIGAM website. So check that, check back on that frequently. Um, other resources, again, you'll find these on the, uh, on the housing section, but uh, Holmes Murphy from the insurance side, uh, uh, fraternal, partner fraternal law partners on the, some legal uh, uh, referrals um, CSL partners as uh, uh, we heard yesterday with uh, John's webinar on the uh, cleaning side alpha fraternity management on a whole range of uh, of uh, fraternity related issues uh, not specifically to kitchen operations but a few observations there as well uh, so that pretty much wraps up our um, our uh, uh, kitchen operation presentation. Look forward to, uh, uh, I'm sure Shauna, you're there for uh, questions or referrals or uh, discussion on um, maybe uh, uh, helping other chapters not yet uh, working with you to uh, understand you what you offer as an option. And uh, upcoming in July, we have a webinar. I don't know if that's a date yet. I see it's been posted on our um, on the FIGAM website. What can you do to make uh, this housing year the best ever? That's very optimistic and encouraging and positive, and we're going to end on that. Uh, always end on a good high note. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon and evening. And with that, uh, we will say goodbye for now. <laughs>